Hello, world. Patricia O'Connor and Frida Reba Dorsey here. And today on the bonsai balcony, we are going to just do, it's our Sunday. And no big lessons, no big whoop. We're just gonna do a little, a little check-in and see how everybody's doing on our balcony. We're just gonna do a little check-in with with their, everybody. Uh, this is a little stash of seeds left over from our um, from our venture where we started our first round of 200 seeds. I uh, didn't see anything sprouting in these. I still do throw water their way from time to time just to make sure there's not any stragglers. But uh, all of the ones that I thought that had, or all the ones that had sprouts in them, uh, made their way to the kitchen. However, last week, a pine tree came up in one that was over, over there. So this one uh, got moved in this place and the one that had a pine tree. So there's, they have still... Uh, they've still come up from time to time even this late in the game to that extent there's a little bit of green there I'm going to keep my eye on that but uh, we have another round started in the kitchen and I'm pretty excited about that we'll just start here these are our wisterias these are both Japanese wisterias this is the one that blooms for me every year and it would be correct in saying that this was my uh, first bonsai tree in this uh, time around of doing bonsai as an adult. And it blooms, it's white, and uh, it's a Japanese sinensis. And um, it does really pretty blooms. Other than that, it's just kind of a stick and I'm working on keeping it small. The one behind it, is a fusion so in other words it's two and uh what i've learned about that is is what i'm also seeing it's sort of the the two the two trees even though they're starting to fuse together even more so below the below the bar below the soil level um the foliage dies back a little different at a little different time the buds swell out a little so it'll probably always do that no matter how tight those two fuse into maybe even looking like one one half of it will bud out on, at one time and the other half will bud out at the second at another time even though they might have been clones but they may not have been clones too one could be purple and one could be white for all I know because I've never seen these guys bloom. Um, this takes us to the um, to our maples. My first year, also aside from doing the uh, the little wisteria bonsai, was I had heard that uh, forests were pretty easy to start, and they are impressive, especially especially to us new guys. Um, so they're easy to do. They kind of fight it out amongst themselves and will make sort of a forest design on, 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 you know, on their own if given a chance. And with pruning and stuff and a little bit of background knowledge, you can actually just do as much or as little as you like and, and come up with an okay forest. This one, I decided to go with Kodahan maples because they have uh, kind of small leaves to begin with. And this is going on about a three year old forest and uh, it's already time for me to go back in and start weeding it again. And I've repotted it one time and um, it's 19 trees. So this is my 19 trees maple forest. The roots are doing some pretty wild stuff, uh, not because of some expertise on my part, but because uh, the way I had the soil mounded up around the individual trees uh, washed away, exposing the roots like that, which I wouldn't have uh, done on purpose, but I didn't want to mess with it since they didn't seem to be, um, since it didn't seem to be. And now I've got these huge root structures, which I think may turn out to be pretty cool. And then if I were to zoom in the forest better, you'd be able to see that quite a few of them are doing that. Um, 
but yeah, that's that, and it is in a uh, Japanese uh, tokonoma uh, pot that is uh, kind of a blue green color. So it's a blue green glaze pot, so that oval. Um, and when they lose their leaves in the winter and they're bare, I think the pot is still really pretty. Next to it is uh, an overpotted Chinese wisteria. I'm going to let this go a little farther this summer with all the stuff that's growing out all over the place and trying to take over the neighborhood. And then I'm going to cut it back. Wisterias always want to be vines. And if you're trying to make a bonsai tree out of a wisteria, that's, that's kind of what you're up against, trying to keep it small. You can make ramification out of them. It takes time and you just kind of, you know, got to stay patient, keep keep cutting them back low. And uh, so far I've never seen this Chinese wisteria bloom either. I was told that uh, it was blue. I don't know, we'll see maybe someday, maybe not. The thing about wisteria is, is if you take a clone from a blooming tree, then you'll get, you can get a blooming wisteria. If you start one from seed, you may be years from, uh, you may be years from seeing it bloom. This is a uh, Japanese black pine that, um, has probably changed its appearance in the time that I've had it more than more than any tree here. That is is one half of what was two little kind of trunks doing this. So after chopping one off, we took the other one and did that with it and exposed the roots underneath it. And that's what we see. You can see the wound here that used to be kind of a goal post and then how that angle comes up. This came up and did the same over here. So it was, it was two of those and it was like this. And there was probably 20 shoots, maybe eight or nine a piece coming off of those two halves. So after chopping it there, we changed the angle and, ex and packed the roots and moss and um, this tree started off being called uh, sweet pea, which stood for sweet potato, because it did, it looked like a sweet potato to me, uh, kind of. Uh, but it was always a really healthy, thriving tree, and I, and I uh, owe a lot to it. It taught me a lot. It also taught me a little about wiring. Not that I wired this tree a lot or did great wiring with it, but it taught me what not to do. These lines that you may be able to see are where the original nursery that grew this tree's at stock um, left the original wire that they put in the trunk bury, and that's what it looks like as the uh, bark pushes out layers and layers and makes new layers and pushes the other one out. There will always be pushing it through those wires, so I think it will always have that. And um, I wouldn't have known, I wouldn't have known what that was or known that it was a thing had I not um, seen what that is and known what it was. And I found out what it was because I'm the person who made this cut and I'm the person who made this cut. And when I did, it looked a little bit like if you were to take a um, cutting wheel on a grinder and cut off a nail out of, out of a piece of wooden plank or something, you can see the little shiny circle of where uh, there's a wire in that board or in this case you can see the little shiny dot where there's a wire buried in the tree and that cut had about three little dots in it where the wire was and uh, as did this one so there was wires all over that thing that it just ate so other than that uh, I still think that this is a very very pretty tree and it's taught me an awful lot its candles are coming out pretty well. It's uh, starting to show signs of bark, which makes it about a 10 year old tree. And when these roots come out and start doing their thing, I'm really gonna be excited to see how the results of that looks. Maybe I can do a little wood carving 
on this cut here and um, make that look a little bit more like a, um, a shari or something. Expose a little, expose a little wood there. And other than that, I'm really looking forward to seeing, this is just uh, some sphagnum moss I packed the roots in. And for a long time, I just, just watered it with a spray bottle. But here recently, I've uh, started watering it with my little uh, Hall's watering can, uh, watering plastic, which I also used to water these guys. It puts out a really good, I really love the their little nozzles are, um, are well thought out and they put out a really good stream. So also the stream works really good on that without tearing up. Uh, without tearing up the moth little embankment I have for all those roots to grow through and grow down and to go down into that pot. So I'm actually pretty encouraged and pretty excited about the um, the looks of uh, what used to be sweet potato, then sweet pea, then um, now simply pea. It's just simply pea. It's uh, Yes, and as Patricia, I could also be simply P too, I suppose. But that's that's what this is with this. Tree. And I, I think it's going through its swan stage from having gone through some ugly duckling stuff before. But uh, I, I think it's more than made up for lost ground, and I'm pretty excited to see what the future holds for simply P. So now that brings us to these guys. Um, quick glance. All of these, not well, okay, all of these but three, this one, this one, and this one, are all little Japanese black pines that are in bonsai pots. These three, as you can see, are in, are in pots to encourage uh, more root growth. We're going to different, I haven't, I haven't potted those in bonsai pots, but um, this, and most of this, represent two orders of 10 Japanese black pines seedlings that I made. And one of them came in with uh, 10, maybe 10 inch to one foot long seedlings for which I did this stuff and this stuff and this stuff and this stuff. And the other order, uh, nine tiny, tiny little seedlings showed up four of which looked like they were in intensive care, but they didn't get it to the extent that would have saved them. So with that, I got about six, and those six would be little beauties, like these little tiny guys here, this one, uh, this one, this one, and a couple of more, the little, the little one, this guy was one of those. So we got some good this little guy right here was one of those. We got some good trees out of that. For uh, what it cost me, I got some really cool little um, mame bean-sized Japanese black pines. And the trick with those is to try to keep them small. Also, during the Bonsai Expo this, uh, this past year, I bought this tree from uh, Eric Schrader's booth. Uh, at the expo, so it was both a memento of the first Bonsai Expo I went to and also Oakland's first expo, which was um, started by Eric and Jonas, but um, but it was a cool little tree and we've done some we've done some extra work. I, I, I chopped it back to the length I wanted it to be to a height I liked and then put some more motion, but it already had good motion to begin with. And let's see, there's another one here that came from Eric. That would be that one that's in the little octagon uh, nut-shaped pot. And it has really good motion in it and exposed roots. And I did that for the $50 challenge. And these guys are overpotted so that we can do more exposed root stuff. And we've got to experiment this past fall with wiring them and repotting them and um, exposing their roots. And we discussed, you know, putting motion in them. And I kind of got a little, um, got a little um, bold 
with the wiring and I have uh, started doing stuff like this and wraps like this and wraps like that, which also led to me doing more stuff like this. You know, this is me getting bolder with the movement. And until I, you know, what you've learned and what you like, or I'll say it this way, what you like plus time becomes your style. So it might be that when you're learning, you go, oh, this is cool. And then that plus a little bit of time and you go, yeah, not so much. I didn't realize it was going to do X or, you know, this is the result of, of that. So, uh, you know, like maybe, uh, you know, some people have a, a love of, this is an example. Some people have a really good love of symmetry. And uh, to some people, they see uh, something with a bunch of bar branches and it inspires them to want to do bonsai. <laughs> And then the first thing they learn is that not to go doing bonds, uh, bar branches. So, you know, it, it, kind of a give and take. So with that, it might be that um, the uh, bold moves that I was encouraged to make um, this past fall plus time will either tell me that I was really on to something. And it wasn't like I'm the only one doing that. I saw some other people who, was, who inspired me. Um, like the guys at Bonsai Q and uh, Kimi Bonsai and people like that. Um, so it's kind of like I followed in, followed in footsteps of people who have been around the block a few times, a little been there and done that. So that's kind of what I would say there, which leads me to this guy. I'm going to hop down before I go to the, this guy. This is a Literati Japanese black pine. I bought it at auction last year. And it's taken me a minute to figure out. It's a beautiful tree. I loved it when I saw it. And um, I had a hard time figuring out what the last person had done. It looked like, you know, I definitely liked their style and their, uh, it looked like everything they had done to the tree, it was really done by somebody who was a, you know, was really good at the craft of bonsai or at the art of bonsai so that much i felt good about but i couldn't tell things about it like for instance we were winding at, or moving our way it was like this time last year or close to this time last year so it should have whenever i saw the tree it was like i didn't see signs where the candles had been cut and i'm like okay so you know we're going into, you know, mid-July, have did the candles get cut? Do I still do that? Do I not do that? So I did that. And I, and um, then I worried about whether or not I did the right thing all year while it looked sparse because I cut the candles at the last, probably past the last possible second. So this year when everything came back, just all oh, nice and thick. And I've been feeding it, you know, I put it in a little feeding program with my bio goal which it's right now it's off of because it's that time of year to start pulling back the little uh, the little cubes and let it just live off of the ones that you uh, put down last so we have a lot of back buds and we've got uh, some really healthy green needles it looks like I've finally learned to behave myself somewhat because I don't see as many needles that uh, have damage from where I um, come reaching in from the top instead of coming instead of coming in from the bottom um, so it's nice to see and it's also nice to see all the all the buds coming out so at some point I might do a little needle reduction on here but I'm probably going to let the candles go on this guy this year and then we'll pick back up next year. Everything's looking really good. And I just kind of want to sit back and go, yeah, that's good. We, we, we like what this thing is doing. Also, I did, a, I did a style on this tree this past year. It had a, another, it had another branch that came out this way, right? And it made it look like that was, and that was the apex, but it was actually, that would have been a bar branch. I think I'm showing you, I don't really know, but that would have been a bar branch. I chopped that and I brought back 
another one someplace in here. I forgot where now, but it had two coming out on the same side. I said a one, 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 one. And I thought it was okay. I thought it was okay that we could, you know, do what we're doing. But I'm really happy with the way uh, this guy is, is uh, flushing out right now. Pretty much wired everything on it that can be wired currently. There's some new sprouts going out. I might have to go through and prune back some of those. Although, although maybe not. I'm not going to commit to it until I just go through. I, I'm going to try to minimize how much I clean this up. I'm not going to do the candles already. If I have too many little buds coming out of one plot uh, in one space, then I'll do some bud selection. But um, the tree looks really nice. And the needles are, uh, could be smaller, but uh, I'm, I'm good with it. No, I'm still good with it. We're just gonna let it hang and be happy. That brings us to this little pair of pondos here. These guys, man, I really enjoy ponderosa pines. I see me doing more like canyon style like this with little seedling of, of ponderosas they their bar does this special thing when it gets a little bit of time to it it's just i think it would really lend itself well to um to my little cheerio bending style and i also think the way you, if you can see i've got these little loops going a little you can kind of go from one tree to the other and see a little carryover to these to these little windswept curls if those were longer they would be looped but as as it is they're just kind of half blown ribbon shaped right but um that looks like going in like it would be too heavy to bend same here that all looked going in like it would be too heavy to bend. And um, you just start working with it and see what it'll do. Um, I think with this one, part of the thing that also helped was it was really wide. I had a lot of choices here. You know, it was a little, it was styled well enough to uh, allow people to see the possibilities with it but it was also wide as elk antlers or something. So there were some choices that were gonna to have to be made as to how much of the tree was going to be kept. And once you make a, once you make a little chop there, it's really easy to grab that piece of wood and, um, and see how much it can take without stretching or at what point does it tear? At what point does it then break? Uh, and that's you know whenever you whenever you cut a piece off of or trim something off of one of your trees rather than just let it hit the ground or hit the waist uh see what it'll do if you fold it up into a pretzel see it see how much of a left hand even though you probably wouldn't want to do that bend see how much of a left hand or a hard right hand bend you can put in that twig or branch that you just cut before it shows uh, irreparable damage. You may surprise yourself as to how much you could, um, you can manipulate some of this stuff. Sometimes we see a branch and we go, yeah, I don't like the position of that. And instead of going, well, I could bend that and fill in this gap, we think, yeah, I could never get away with bending that. We should just, it's in the wrong place. And if we cut it, maybe we can get uh, vibrication there and it'll fill in both gaps. Well, why don't you try bending it first? If you've already decided that plan B, if you've already decided that plan A, which should be plan B is to cut it, well, try bending it first and then you can still cut it. If it doesn't go out, it doesn't uh, work well. I kind of started thinking more that way with this guy and I got away with a little more than uh, I would have thought I got away with. And I also did the same on that Ponderosa over there, the one I called Babe, which was the first one of the two. I was like, I was about to chop off a branch and I thought, well, what if you actually just got it to bend farther in to where it wasn't, um, wasn't as wide, wouldn't that? And that was actually a beneficial lesson. 
which brings us to what we're looking at now, which is my um, California coastal oak. It has a hollow feature. This tree was sorted, started from acorn from a uh, nurseryman who, uh, this was their project. They started uh, the way I, I think I remember the story. They started a hundred or so little acorns and then 38 years later, I believe, 35 years later, something like that, uh, the wife is selling the uh, nursery and uh, the stock of trees. And this was the one that um, he had kept all that time. This tree is really pretty. I really have always enjoyed it. It's got some, got some really good bark and trunk. And uh, it's just uh, last year we suffered, or year before last, we suffered for, uh, a large amount of dieback, which meant that I had to do some hellacious chops to try to, to try to get in ahead of it. It was just like parts of it were turning black by the day, and I would just cut those off plus an inch to try to to try to you know get ahead of what looked like gangrene or something setting into my tree and um that put us in repair mode we haven't yet gotten to the point to where we're cutting branches that we don't want we're still keeping some things we don't want right now just to continue to fill in the tree but by and large we've come a long way in rebuilding this in rebuilding this baby and it was pretty much uh, it was pretty much what happened to it that put me on the road to getting my head right, to learning about uh, pests, disease, and prevention. So that, and feeding, which is also, um, this guy is just flushing out and it's more fun to ramify when it starts just flushing out as much as it does, which is also what I would say about my cork fork oak. This is one of my first uh, bonsai trees. This tree uh, was, I think, an air layer done by uh, Johnny Cedar, who um, had uh, a nursery in California called uh, Groveway Nursery. Had the, uh, had, I think the nursery is still being run by uh, his son, although I haven't checked lately, but I believe that I believe that's good information. I love this tree. It had the same issue that that one did at the same time and got the same treatments, but bounced back better. But at the same time, whenever I got this tree, it was just during COVID and uh, cork bark oaks are known for their resilience to drought. And whereas this nursery had uh, some prize winning maples, it was my thinking that they had probably just kind of skimmed over this one, knowing that it could probably last longer without as much water. I think during COVID, during the beginning of it, especially some, some nurseries had to make decisions over what did and what didn't get water. And so this guy had a little bit of dye back when I got it, but I fell in love with that trunk and uh, wasn't, wasn't beyond going in, um, grabbing some cash and swinging back and coming in and getting it. And I've been learning about rebuilding it ever since. About uh, last year, I got a couple of more pieces of the puzzle to figure out what, uh, what I needed to do to keep it happier and healthier and stuff. And since then, it's just filling out a lot more. Prior, prior to my fill, filling in the last pieces of the puzzle on how to grow cork bark oaks and oaks in general, uh, it had a big tendency to grow long sticks with little plumes on the end and nothing between there and the trunk, which which means it was just growing branches you didn't want to keep. Uh, so yeah, but uh, this is an impressive tree in, in my mind. I have learned a lot from it. And I would say, um, I nicknamed this tree Log, and it is, look at that, it looks like, you know, kind of a Ren and Stimpy reference to their song Log, but um, it's been a really rewarding tree to grow. They're not hard to keep alive. They are tricky to ramify, but the, uh, the secret is, is to cut off the ends on the eight, on the eight typically dominant pieces so that they release the oxen so that they will encourage other parts below that 
to uh, freak out and think that they can be head honcho for a while. And that just kind of keeps the tree uh, pushing out sprouts and shoots. And whenever something gets really, really long and the nodes start spreading out between them, I chop it. Then I can get a vibrication off of that. And with feeding it and uh, the right amount of water, I can get two, three flushes of growth easy out of a summer's growth, out of a summer's uh, of, with this tree. That's kind of what we got last year, at least, if not more. Next to it is our Dawn Redwood. And that's the tree I learned about what happens when you chop a tree back and it flushes back with so much energy that you think you can do that forever. And uh, I sucked the energy out of this tree two years ago. And now we're just kind of letting it, we're just kind of feeding it and watering it and letting it do whatever the heck it wants to do. Take Sundays off, just, you know, raid the refrigerator, doesn't have to label anything. We're not worried about it. You just, you know, you just get well. And then at some point I'll um, come up with a new styling plan. Probably start wiring some of that stuff that's trying to be other tops. That's also what they do in the wild. When a lot of times, when you look in the wild, dawn redwoods or or uh, the giant sequoias and those guys, their little crown, their little apex will die off, and then it'll become four of them, and uh, that'll be the top. And if you were flying over or doing a drone shot of that, you wouldn't see some perfect little steeple chase point coming up the way my little cypresses are doing there, you would see more of a blunt end the way a bunch of shoots at one point, maybe the center died off. And so then four shoots came out in a, a whirlwind pattern and then they all decided they were all apexes and they're all hanging up at the top waiting for the other ones to uh, kick off. That's kind of what those, those trees do. They don't always, you know, those really, really, really old ones um, don't typically have. Um, are not typically symmetrical in the way that uh, specimen trees are said to be, but that's also a sign of age. The older something is and the cooler it is, a lot of times the less uh, symmetrical it is. And um, we both kind of crave that in some ways, and in other ways we don't always recognize that as what we're really looking for in the beauty, which is the age of a tree. Next to that, it's my trident maple, and it looks like it's doing really, really well. It is. It's out of the wind. It also out of the western sunlight, which was burning it. It also loves, loves, loves the uh, my LEDs. So at some point here in a minute, I'll go about every every one other one of those, and I'll chop them back down to canopy, just below canopy level, while letting the others continue to do their thing. And then it, and then later at some point, I'll cut those back to do the same, but we're gonna let, we're gonna let part of those continue to do the energy thing that they're doing. And I'm just gonna make a nice little, no big whoop canopy, uh, kind of an umbrella shaped canopy out of my, uh, out of my, um, Trident maple. It's uh, something that I acquired in the first year that I had bonsai. I really kind of like the trunk. I like the swoop and the swooping uh, lean to the uh, to the trunk. And it, it's just an all around pleasing tree. I've always enjoyed this tree. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting to getting it back into a nice shape. This I need to cut this. This. Japanese black pine uh, started by Jonas of uh, Bonsai tonight, 17 years from seed. Um, we're going into uh, candle cutting season for this guy here in just uh, short, shortly. And uh, then I'll probably do a little bit of needle reduction too at the same time. It's a really pretty tree and this is this is exactly why we should learn our lessons about um, doing root work early as possible. The big, huge, impressive base to this guy is largely owed to fanning out the roots so that we get this, this 
really impressive, really broad hip. You know, that's, that's, that's when Jonas says, one of the first things you want to work on is get started on your roots as early as possible. That's why. And that is the, uh, and that is also, uh, why you would do that. That is just, and that's, that's why I love part of the reason why I love that. That and a hundred other reasons are why I love, or why I love that time. This is my, um, 75 year old cork bark Japanese black pine. I'm the third person to have this tree and I won't be doing candle cutting on it. We're just taking the time off you. Uh, one, you don't do candle cuttings every year uh, for cork bark pines, especially older cork bark pines. And uh, to that, to that, we are taking, we're taking this year off and letting that guy have a break. I love this tree. I think it's, I think it's cork, it's, it's bark, it's just really impressive. It's a grafted tree uh, somewhere in here. If those who know would see it just as kind of like I do now, right here, what looks like just the feature of, of a tree is actually where it goes from uh, cork, where it goes from black pine stock to cork bark stock. And the cork bark is those blocks sticking up for just like you know, air. I'm gonna do a little tip out and we'll look up into the sky. That's what they do. It is a, it is a result of fighting off something. I've looked into it. I don't know. I haven't found anybody that knows. I found people who I trust for information and I've seen them say they don't know, but it's, but these guys get the case of the sniffles from something um, as babies or as seeds or as, or as, you know, whatever they get pollinated or whatever. And they're always going to be uh, cork bark pines. And it can happen to more than one species. And it's kind of like a one in a thousand. And you can't take air layers off of them because their roots are not healthy enough to um, to be that vital to get started. They'll just die on the vine. You can um, graft them onto other stock, which is what how that one was made. I would like to find a cork bark oak seedling and I've thought about it. I've thought about, you know, next time you do candle cutting on that and you've got it, a hundred little candles sitting there on the floor. Those could be in a pitcher of water getting ready. But from what I've been told, no luck. Uh, on other on other black pines, which you can kind of do cuttings, even then it's one in a hundred will uh, root. And cork bark uh, black pines are going to be just about nada compared to that. So yeah, that's kind of the way that goes. Uh, I even wondered if you could take a candle and air layer it, and I'm told that they would never, that if they ever started a root, they, they probably wouldn't. They probably wouldn't even root. And if they did, it wouldn't last the amount of time that an air layer would have to um, last to actually to get off and running. So according to the heavy hitters, no luck there. All right, that brings us to my first uh, swing for the fences. And that's this guy, these guys, the three amigos. This is three American bald cypress trees and they would be imperial in uh, their uh, designation of bonsai. They're in a training pot, which holds a lot of substrate. And their substrate is uh, Akadama. That was a mistake. I should have made that big chunky, chunky thing so they would make big chunky roots because right now we need to grow big chunky pieces of wood. 
whenever you do what I'm doing or what I did, that would that would be a great way to grow fine roots, which is later later, not now. I didn't know that then, so I bought the good stuff. Um, yeah, well, that's the way it goes. Everything else we did, we did right, and the things we did wrong, we did because we were trying to do them right. So uh, it's not like the tree is hurt by that. I probably slowed down our development a little by um, by that little one little trick. Live and learn. Uh, I've had this guy, these guys going on three years now, and uh, I bought the two outside trees from a supplier in northern Louisiana, and I um, bought the center tree off of a buyer's list. Uh, uh, a local bonsai grower has a blog, and on that blog, every once in a while, they show, they list their trees that they have for sale, as well as they will list people that are in their, that are in their circle who have bonsai trees for sale. And it was in one of those little, in one of those, these are my buddy's trees, a little, little bazaar that I came across, that I came across um, that center cypress tree. And uh, I contacted the guy who had it and he came out in his van with a big rolling bonsai table and delivered it. And I just, yeah, that ended up being the, the third piece for those. And it's been a lot of fun to grow those. It's a lot of fun to watch them change colors over the years. Um, I've learned quite a bit about uh, bald cypress. I would say they are one of the more uh, easier bonsai trees to grow. Basically water them and uh, they'll live, water them and feed them and they'll thrive. They can grow as, I think I've seen them as far up as Michigan and as far down as Mexico um, and still be a, an American bald cypress variety. There are other species of bald cypress that grow um, down farther, farther south you go in Mexico. I don't remember the name of those off the top of my head, but it, you can kind of recognize it as being a, um, a cousin to these guys, but then you're talking about a different, I'm still talking about this basic tree you can find uh, as far south as Mexico and as far north from what I've been told is some of the, um, well, actually I've seen them, some of the um, bonsai gardens and uh, some of the state parks in Michigan. So yeah, that's where, you know, they're really healthy. They're really hardy. They've been around since, since there were trees. They were some of the original stock that grew here and, uh, I really enjoyed growing the bald cypress. I would say that between everything on the balcony, the bald cypress and the wisteria would be easier for most people to keep alive on the day today. I'm not talking about how hard it is to ramify or make a bonsai or do this, but if you wanted to keep something alive long enough to learn how to make it be a bonsai, you could probably get away with that if you could if you can water it. If you can water uh, ball cypress every day, uh, it'll definitely live. If you can't water it every day, put it in a small pan of water, not enough to not not enough to go over the top of the pot for a prolonged amount of time. But you could put it in a dish with with water in it and then blow town for a couple of weeks. Same with the same with the wisteria. It's possible to drown them, but um, if you kind of if if you get the knack of it you won't and you can you can get away with growing those that way so yeah that's kind of a quick rundown the only thing that i've left out is i currently have uh 11 seedlings uh, that are in the kitchen under a fluorescent light growing staying staying safe from the vultures that uh, would come through and tear up everything and um but I have, but I have ten more seeds that I've germinated and planted in with them, and we're gonna see if those guys come up. And then once they come up, maybe we'll take those ten in a minute when they're old enough to survive the vultures, and we'll put them out here on the rack, and then we'll let the ten that we just started get big enough until they can survive that too. 
So that's kind of got us. It's just a little slow roll on our Sunday. Um, little shout out to Tony at Tony's Bonsai. Thank you so much, Tony. We've learned. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us a glimpse of your life. You've uh, taught us how to do bonsai. You taught us how to be a um, video YouTube creator. And, um, and you taught us how to live. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for watching.